Hello, everybody. On this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we have AMD Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 3 with Radeon Vega graphics, some NVIDIA GeForce rumors, some awesome benchmarks from the Snapdragon 845, and a whole lot more. Ha, you see that? We mixed it up on you. That was Marco doing the tease there. How do you like that? Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. So, yeah, we figured we'd mix it up and, you know, try and keep it fresh for y'all on, on on the day in which we will do it until it's red. How are you guys you doing, You caught Marco? me off guard oh. on that one. I, I almost thought I was in the wrong podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard to confuse you, right, Paul? <laughs> some, some days. <laughs> <laughs> some days. Marco, how are you doing over there? Is uh, everything good in Connecticut land? The land of everything the everything is as good as can be expected when I'm involved. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Excellent. Happy Valentine's Day, fellas. You are uh, organized for the ladies this evening. Are you? Um, or are you going to be in the doghouse? I think I'm organized. We will see. I'll probably still do something stupid and end up in the doghouse, but I'm trying not to. <laughs> Paul. Paul, you get your swerve on, brother. So far, so good. We'll we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, when you get to be a certain age, and you know, you've been with a significant other for a certain amount of time, it's really hard to keep it like you know, whatever, fresh, whatever, right? So that's why we threw Marco at you today on the tease, just to mix it up, because we're trying to be innovative already. We're getting in that innovative mood for Valentine. Oh, so, you know, speaking of innovating. In the spirit of Valentine's Day, because I know my wife's not watching, pro tip no, for all God. you fellas out there. If you want roses and you don't want to get gouged by a florist, Whole Foods, baby. Two dozen roses, $19.99. Yes. Oh, a plug, man. And that's not even <laughs> sponsored. <laughs> hey. Jeff Bezos is going, I love that guy, Marco. That's right. Uh, <laughs> good stuff good stuff actually that's a pretty good deal i i head to a grocery store myself usually because yeah um yeah going to the florist is usually a ripoff and ftd and all that stuff yeah. but hey you know um we're, we're here to talk tech not um ro romance advice thank god <laughs> god help you all if you <laughs> yes, were you do not <laughs> want to listen to me <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk tech here and we've got a lot to talk about it's uh, it's been a while we skipped a week there we were traveling last week sorry we missed you folks but we're back here every wednesday or at least we try to be every wednesday at 4 p.m eastern the show we call two and a half geeks where you will have to figure out which one of us is the half geek um usually it's me but uh, we'll let you figure that out as we go uh hey let's let's talk some some good stuff from the folks at amd with ryzen 5 and ryzen 3 raven ridge on the desktop uh, we saw um raven ridge in uh notebooks uh, but now uh, the desktop cpus with integrated amd radeon rx vega graphics marco you kicked the tires pretty hard on these new cpus from amd uh, they still rising up those folks over there in uh what is it sunnyvale yeah uh, it depends on how you look at it. Um, the short answer is yes. Let me pull out my huge monstrous uh, platform that I tested on. You have to love this. <laughs> so this is a, a gigabyte it's like a drone. Uh, 350 mini ITX motherboard. Um, you have to trust me that underneath there, underneath that uh, stock AMD heatsink, I think in here right now is the, the Ryzen 3 2200G. Got 16 gigs of beautiful G-Skill memory right there. G-Skill are good folks. They... Uh, their memory has been in our test beds for quite some some time here. So yeah, these, this is the platform that we tested on. Um, Ryzen 3 2200G is only 100 bucks. Ryzen 5 2400G, $169. Now what makes these CPU special, as Dave mentioned, is you have Ryzen processor cores in addition to uh, Radeon Vega-based GPU all on a single piece of silicon. So you know this is basically amd's updated apus with their latest cpu cores and latest gpu engine mm -hmm. on board that targets sort of mainstream and small form factor and all-in-one type systems and you know through the testing some interesting results uh 
you may think AMD just took Ryzen and bolted on Vega and they were done with it, but there are some actually some changes in, in to the way the CPU is implemented. So on the, the first gen Ryzen, I'm going to use the, the Ryzen 3 1200 as the example because it's kind of the direct equivalent to the, the Ryzen 3 2200G. On a, on a Ryzen 3 1200, those quad cores that are on board are separated into two CCXs. You have two cores in one, two cores in another, and each of those CCXs has uh, you know, a complement of cache. So total L3 cache on a Ryzen 3 1200 is eight megabytes. On the Ryzen 3 2200G, the, the CPU cores are arranged in only a single CCX. So you have just one CCX with all four cores active, but end up with half the cache. So it's slightly different setup to offset that, to offset the, the smaller amount of L3 cache. AMD has tweaked Precision Boost. Um, it's now opportunistic and you have more of a gradual taper off and it's not just one or another mode. And you also have higher clocks. So if you come by the site, check out all our tests. I have CPU tests, I have graphics tests. Um, you'll see the Ryzen 3 2200G and the, the Ryzen 5 2400G in general, in heavy compute workloads like um, like Cinebench or Blender or Pavre, it's generally faster than the first gen standard desktop Ryzen. In some tests like games or other tests where like the 3 Mark physics test where that L3 cache would come in handy, it can be somewhat slower. Um, it was especially in like audio encoding where it was um, a fair amount slower than the first gen, but you get literally no bar none uh, I'm not exaggerating, the best integrated graphics ever of any CPU. So versus, say, Intel's best mainstream uh, processor with a UHD 630 graphics, up to three times as fast. Typically, you know, 80% to 100 plus percent faster, but up to 3x as fast. That's the quick hmm. gist. Cool. Yeah. So, so, so talk to me real quick about, about this. Um, there, there's a little bit of a trade-off here. Um, CPUs versus the, the non-integrated chips, the first generation of Ryzen five mm -hmm. and three chips, uh, the, the cache, um, is it's got half, half the L three cache. Um, yeah. but you've got one fewer hops in, in the CCXs, right? So how do, how does that work trade-off wise? I don't, I don't know if you, you know, does it? I mean, are we, are we talking about much of a of a difference there? Do you do you miss that that cache? You would think in some applications you might. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's going to depend on the workload. It's it's mostly a wash. You know, in in AMD's documentation, they said they tested across fifty different games, and it was mostly a wash. The higher clocks and the lower latency of, of having everything in a single C CCX offsets the smaller amount of cache but it's not universal. There will be instances where that extra cache comes in handy and these chips can be slower. Like I said, in the audio encoding was a particular test where we're slower, 3D Mark's physics test, it was slower. There will be areas where it's slower. Now, it's not, it's not massively slower, so it's still in sort of the same league but you get the awesome graphics built in. You know, not only do you get yeah. this, so relatively speaking, it's not, it, it could, the graphics on board here could replace say a 60 to $80 discrete GPU. It's not gonna replace, you know, a, a Vega 64, but if you just want mainstream quality graphics with AMD's latest generation GPU core, you get it here. So you also get the goodness of AMD's, AMD's drivers as well. You don't have to contend with, you know, GPU drivers that may not be great on a another CPU core. You get uh, AMD's uh, Radeon Crimson Crimson Edition software here with these CPUs. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Um, what what do, where do you see this uh, playing in the market? I mean, obviously, um, this thing screams certain applications really, uh, uh, um, you know, st straight up like home theater PC. Um, you can think of any any case where integrated graphics um, and that the efficiency that it brings certainly in that micro ITX board you have right there. Um, what about on the OEM side? Do you, do you see all in ones with this or, or where is this? Where, where's, where's the market application, I guess, the bulk of the market application for this chip? Um, I think they're, they're, they'd be great for corporate PCs where a quad core and good graphics in a nice low power package would be nice. They would be great for home theater PCs. They will be great for entry-level gaming PCs. I know 
enthusiasts that read sites like ours that kind of cringe at thinking about gaming on a on an integrated GPU. But if you go look at the Steam hardware survey, there are you know millions of gamers that are gaming on integrated graphics. So you would literally get the best integrated graphics. Um, for example, in Shadow of War with medium details at 1080p, the Ryzen 5 2400G hit 40 frames per second. Now the Ryzen 3 has a few fewer uh, compute units in the GPU, but it too, I think it was at 32 frames a second at medium detail 1080p. So if you were to crank it down to 720p or even lower the details, that's a sm smooth frame rates in a fairly new game. Now, is it gonna offer smooth frame rates in every single game at those resolutions? No, but it has essentially the same GPU cores as AMD's top of the line Vega 64. So it, it is going to be compatible with everything. It has the ability to run anything out there. You just may have to dial down the details to do it. Um, I think it would be a great candidate for all-in-one PCs. The, um, mm. I, let me go double check my numbers. The Ryzen 3 2200G, I believe under load only pulled 71 watts. Our system only <laughs> pulled 71 watts. The Ryzen 5 um, pulled something like 100 even. So they're not very high power. I mean, I'm sure some of you watching this have light bulbs that are pulling 100 watts right now. So they're really, really nice. You. Uh, it boils down to a very competitive quad core CPU and up to eight threads with the Ryzen 5 with the best integrated graphics available. So they're, they're an interesting proposition. If you look at Intel now, you know, they're, they're integrating Vega graphics on some of their special processors. So in this yeah. sort of, in the space where these CPUs play, if, uh, you know, a system builder decides to go AMD, you're gonna end up with Vega graphics and really the competing Intel part to these will also have Vega graphics. So it's sort of like AMD is gonna win at a few different angles here with the, these chips put an interesting amount of pressure on Intel. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And, and in, like you said, if you look at the scores, I mean, in Shadow of War, just from a gaming and graphics perspective, uh, uh, almost 2X Intel's integrated UHD 630 uh, GPU performance wise. So so pretty, pretty good stuff. Um, so this, uh, the integrated GPU goes off the system memory for its frame buffer cache, right? There's right. no on-chip cache, just this, yeah, the L3 cache is there. Um, I'm sure folks want to know, can can you also do Crossfire with a discrete card in there? Should you have an AMD uh, discrete GPU to add to the mix? Uh, AMD has not talked about it. I don't think there are any technical limitations, but what everyone has to remember with multi-GPU, with traditional Crossfire, right, or right. SLI, right. if you pair two cards together, the most, the absolute best performance you can possibly expect is double the slowest card. So there are no Vegas in the same class as this integrated GPU, so it would be pointless to pair it to something. With that said, um, DX12 game developers could code to hmm. use this in addition to a discrete GPU. Don't think it will be very common. I don't think that's sort of the use case. And, you know, things are getting to the point now where you're almost always better with a single, single higher powered card than going the multi GPU route. Gotcha. Gotcha. Paul, what do you think about Raven Ridge on the desktop? It's an interesting release for me and D. Uh, and there's a, a few different markets for it, I think. If we're going to focus just on uh, the gaming aspect, which is what I would be interested in, um, there's a few different markets there. If, if someone's looking to put together a budget gaming PC and they're more of a casual gamer than a hardcore gamer, then these fit the bill, especially the, uh, the Ryzen 5 2400, the more powerful chip. Um, if you're looking to recommend something for someone else who's a gamer looking to build a cheap gaming pc for their kids or if you're wanting to build now and you know you don't want to overpay for a graphics card since everything is the prices are jacked up right now you could build an amd system around this play some games at lower settings and then you know once graphics cards come down in price you could sell that chip on ebay or craigslist upgrade to um a different ryzen processor and slap a graphics card in there and there you go you know no worse off for wear right right yeah i know it, it's a very interesting dynamic that right now for amd and they have really turned it around nicely in terms of just their market opportunity um you know when they brought ryzen to the fold you know way back uh, in at its launch um certainly it was a um you know it was absolutely a, a pivotal moment for them 
an inflection point um, where they had been, you know, well behind Intel performance wise for a long time now. Now we're looking at a case where from a CPU perspective, this thing competes dollar for dollar with Intel, no problem, brings with it AMD's integrated graphics goodness that that Intel can't match. And so it's a it's a it's an interesting and powerful value proposition for the consumer out there. And man, yeah, you, you know, um, you, you never thought, if, you know, back in the day when when Intel had such dominance that AMD would give them something to think about and go back to the drawing board. But clearly the Intel is now and tr trying to get more creative by bringing, you know, a discrete or I should say integrating an AMD GPU on on their mobile chip that they did recently with that hybrid chip. Um, yeah, just, um, you know, sort of major market shifts, you know, being influenced by AMD. And I think it speaks volumes for for how they've turned this thing around and how Lisa Sue has, you know, turned this thing around with the company. Impressive stuff, right, Marco? Yeah, absolutely. And, and no signs of slowing down, you know, uh, second gen Ryzen coming in April, second gen Ryzen Threadripper coming in June. Um, I'm sure those cores are going to work their way into a next gen Epic further down the road. So, you know, AMD put a ton of pressure on Intel in, in desktop and servers in 2017 and actually notebooks, although that's kind of a little slower going for them. And in 2018, they're going to do it all over again. And now with this, with Raven Ridge as well, with a totally new lineup with integrated Vega graphics. So um, going to be a, another fun year for us here with uh, lots of testing to do. Yeah. Yeah, man. No, it's great stuff. And, you know, we, as much as anybody appreciate the competitive market dynamic, it gets every, all the, all the players, um, you know, fired up to, to compete. And that's a good thing when there's major dominance in any one sector. It, it, I, I think the tendency is to, to think that, you know, perhaps it invokes some complacency at, at the manufacturer level. And certainly I guess on a, on a level it, it does, but, um, yeah, good to have that that uh, competitiveness and back in market are a real credible threat for Intel. Keeps them on their toes and get more options for the consumer. Nothing but goodness all around, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. So, and Chris, Chris in the chat <clears throat> asks, I missed a few minutes. Crossfire question mark. Uh, theoretically, yes, Chris, but as Marco pointed out, probably not worth doing because. Uh, of the performance uh, delta, where if you add another a secondary discrete GPU in, it's only going to be as fast as, you know, two x the 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 slowest GPU, right, Marco? Is that fairly summing it up? <laughs> yeah, theoretically, that's as fast as going to get, and there's no low end Vega to pair it to. So, but again, DX12, someone could, you know, game developer could use the the discrete multi GPU mode if they wanted to, but it's probably not going to happen very often. Yeah, I wonder. Do you, do you think we we'd see more of that? You know, once DX12 gets out there, more mainstream, more, um, you know, in in the the rendering pipeline of the majority of game engines, will we not see you know multi GPU optimizations? You know, come back into into the fray here. I mean, it, it would make sense. I, I would I, think. I don't. I don't think so in in the traditional sense. Um, like we used to have it where it was just alternate frame rendering. I think right. we'll probably get to the point where um, whether it's it probably be, will be a, another iteration of DirectX or some sort of update where it's just going to leverage whatever compute resources are available in a system, whether it's multiple yeah. GPUs, CPUs, what have you. Um, but right now it requires specific coding and not all the game developers are doing it, nor do they want to. So we're in this sort of weird limbo state right now. So it's up to Microsoft and company and, and the folks that are part of you know, uh, setting the standard for the API to 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 look at that and work on that, enable it better better for developers. I guess we'll have to pin yes. the folks at AMD on that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, that's that's putting it simply, right? I mean, there's there's a lot more to it than that. But it, it, exactly, like th there is more to it. But right now, uh, the focus is is single GPU. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, speaking of GPUs, let's move on to something that uh, Paul picked up on the wire uh, last week or this week. I'm trying to think when we broke that news. But um, there is rumor of a GeForce GTX 2080, question mark, floating around the web. What's this beast, Paul? And and I'm hearing all kinds of cool code names like Ampere and Turing and all kinds of, you know, 
references to current and voltage and power and guys with patents to their names or theories, electronic theories. What do you got, Paul? <laughs> yeah, we're hearing a lot lately. So if you're a frequent visitor, visitor to Hot Hardware, and we hope you are, um, you yes, know you we sometimes be. hang out at the rumor mill. And in doing so, we came across some interesting information about what's supposedly NVIDIA's next generation GPU for consumers and gamers and surprise, surprise, it's not Volta, or at least it's not called Volta. Um, now, one of the ports we read from a German language website said that Invi NVIDIA had basically phased out production of its GP102 GPU that they use in their GeForce GTX 1080 uh, Ti graphics card and their current generation Titan cards. And in the months to come, and I think they might have even said um, as soon as next month, I said NVIDIA will unveil a new GPU named Ampere, supposedly. Uh, that's rumor number one that we came across. And we didn't put a whole lot of stock into it because it was basically based on a forum discussion, um, I guess, with someone claiming to have inside information. You know, and mm. on top of that, it's always a little fuzzy when you're working with a translated article on Google. Um, but <laughs> following this of Ampere, there was an article at Reuters, um, which is a more reliable source, that also mentioned a new GPU from NVIDIA called Turing. And unfortunately, it was mentioned in passing. The report didn't really go into any kind of detail other than to mention that it's called Turing and to say that it's specifically for gaming. So we have two rumored code names for NVIDIA's next generation GPU, supposedly, Ampere and Turing. Um, it's possible that both are bogus. It's also possible that one will apply to graphics cards for gamers, which Ruder says is Turing, and the other would be built um, specifically for cryptocurrency mining cards. And wouldn't that be nice if NVIDIA could create some separation in the marketplace between, you know, gaming cards and cryptocurrency cards. So, you know, gamers, when they want to buy a graphics card, they actually could go out and get one. Uh, whether or not these are actually Volta GPUs minus the Tensor cores, who knows? There's not a whole lot of information out there right now other than rumored names and we don't even know if we're if they're real but that's the water cooler talk right now keep your eyes out for the new gpu from nvidia it might be called impure it might be called turing they might have both who knows stay tuned <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know interesting stuff it's always great to uh to pick up on the on the rumors and the speculation out there and there's and there's sometimes you know, plenty of <clears throat> back channel information that gets leaked out from folks that are connected and and probably shouldn't be leaking that that information. But we report on it if it's if it's out there <clears throat> and it's um, and it's bubbling around. We'll report on it um, when we're under NDA. Um, we certainly can't say a darn thing about what we know. <laughs> but but what other folks might <clears throat> might speculate on and what other folks say they know, we certainly report on. And uh, yeah, this is this is an, an interesting uh, time. I think it makes a lot of sense. We've got uh, Marco heading off to NVIDIA GTC next month, right, Marco? In March, right? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, GPU technology conference for NVIDIA. So theoretically, it would make sense that maybe uh, <clears throat> NVIDIA announces something out there. Paul, you mentioned uh, the next generation GPU from NVIDIA. You know, what's it going to look like? Could it have? Could it be Volta minus the tensor cores? Uh, for folks that aren't familiar with what a tensor core is, that is a machine learning uh, AI uh, and uh, you know deep deep learning um, type processor uh, element processor block inside the GPU for Volta that uh, accelerates machine learning applications and machine learning uh, code specifically instructions. So <clears throat> yeah, it would make sense that. You know, certainly on the gaming side, we don't need those cores for machine learning. Um, and, and it, but but what's fascinating here too is is that whole dynamic about cryptocurrency and why release a new GPU technology in the market when the miners are going to just gobble it up, crank prices you know off the hook for the average gamer and make it unattainable. Will Nvidia do something to um, position a card in market that caters to to miners to take some of the pressure off? Uh, GPU consumption for gamers. That's a that's a big question mark. It'll be very interesting to watch if that comes to to fruition. Marco, do you have any theories there? Any any thoughts that you can share without having to shoot us for for knowing uh, too much? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was literally a full year ago where we first um, where Volta was first unveiled. So 
the G N Nvidia's got the GPUs, right? There's no way they don't have mainstream consumer ready Volta based GPUs. What the configurations are is the other question. Um, I too believe it makes sense to go ahead and embrace the crypto market because it's not going away yet and to try to control the supply and to make mining specific cards and to maybe limit mining somehow on the gaming cards so that they're not getting gobbled up and artificially inflated in terms of price. Um, Next month, GDC is also happening, the Game Developers Conference, a little bit right. later than GTC. So could be an announcement there if it's a gaming-specific card. If, if there's something that's not just for gaming, maybe I will see it at GTC. I really don't know. Um, but it's even though NVIDIA is still in a dominant position at the top end of the graphics space, Vega 64 with the latest driver updates is competing very well with the 1080, but... 1080 Ti is out there, so is uh, you know the Titan Titan X. Um, so Nvidia still has the overall performance crown. It has they haven't relinquished it for I guess what about a year and a half now? Oh, two years mm. I guess almost. So they don't have to release anything if they don't want to, but it's about time to stir things up. I hope they do. Yeah, yeah. What do you think AMD's got cooking, man? I mean, geez, they 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 have to they have some catch up to do, and if Nvidia comes out with, you know. The next generation GPU for gamers, and you know, takes it up another couple of notches as they usually do. You know, what's what's AMD get, AMD going to do to get back to relevance in in that space? I mean, sure, Vega sixty four, Vega fifty six, they're they're um, interesting alternatives, uh, good option at certain price points. Um, but what 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 do they have to do uh, on the GPU side to to get back in action with uh, you know versus their their chief rival uh, on the green team? I don't think there's anything they can do on the software front. So if if Vega's going to be carrying the torch for the foreseeable future, it lit, it will take a respin. Um, period. Uh, may, maybe some sort of um, advancements in HBM two. Obviously, better supply um, would have to happen. So if if Vega is, is it for 2018, it it will take a respin and higher clocks and some some major tweaking to um to bring some serious additional performance out of it. I really don't know what's going to happen. I, I think that AMD, after kicking butt on the graphics side for some time, now that Raja's gone and they, they do have some new leadership, but I, I don't know what's going to happen there. If you kind of step back and you eliminate cryptocurrency from the equation, what would AMD's graphics business look like today? You know, that's a tough question to answer, but I don't think it would be very pretty with yeah. what NVIDIA has done to them. So, yeah, I, I hope they pull something off, AMD. I mean, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt after uh, really getting beat up for a decade from Intel, and boom, here we are now where AMD is the, the hot, fun CPU to talk about. So can be done. I hope they pull something you know, off. Isn't that, a, isn't that a wild thing, right? Like a total turning of the tables. It, it used to be not too long ago that, that AMD's GPU business really was the, you know, the sort of the forerunner from a technology standpoint and and you know driving the company and cpu was there and it was important and they had market share um just that you know they were playing catch up so so hard versus intel and couldn't couldn't really you know make that happen there was there was an execution problem there now executing like nobody's business on the cpu side apparently and gpus are kind of like okay it, it it seems like that's an area for AMD executive management to to clean up next, right? I don't know. What do you think, Marco? Is that is that well, I mean, they they, they, they lost up? they lost their head. Raj is gone, so I mean, yeah. it's it's new leadership there now. Um, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. N Navi, if I'm remembering correctly, the design was done or it was close to done. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, it's a monster. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. Wild stuff. Good stuff. Um. And yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. Oh, um, well, one other thing that comes to mind on on the the next generation NVIDIA platform, you, you mentioned high speed memory, uh, HBM two, and whatnot for AMD is a possible um, area of of strength. Um, but we've we've heard some interesting things from uh, the DD the GDDR side uh, of the equation um, that could blend in and meld in well with next generation nvidia product uh micron came out and said gddr6 is coming and it's in the i think it was first half uh this year time frame uh and even higher speed higher bandwidth gddr5 
Um, so, and I think a couple of players came out more than just Micron. I want to say it may have been um, Hynix um, that also came out and said GDDR6 is 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 here and and close and and will be shipping in market uh, first half. How, what do you think about the prospects of us having uh, a, either? A, what do you think? Uh, we, are we looking at HBM on the next generation in video, or is it more GDR? uh gddr technology um with its cost efficiencies um there with with the standard implementation um i think for anything mainstream it will be gddr5 5x or 6. um yeah. and maybe uh maybe hbm on a um some sort of super high-end card a 2080 ti there's been no rumors of that yet M maybe that card would have hbm too it will be if there's HBM2 on a consumer targeted card, it will be the highest performance, lowest volume model. Mm, yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, certainly HBM uh, has cost um, characteristics that, you know, make it, you know, just more expensive to implement versus uh, GDDR. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating time. We really have a lot of technologies converging, certainly from, from a, high-speed memory interface standpoint, uh, as well as GPUs. So we'll have to, have to see how this all shakes out. I think you're going to be, you and I are going to be busy, and Paul, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in the next few months. We got, we got more to go, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. That's what keeps it fresh and interesting for us in tech. That's why we love it so much. There's always something, something else on the horizon. And let's talk, about, um, let's talk about the mobile space and what's on the horizon for folks uh, looking at and considering next generation smartphones. Qualcomm uh, flew me out to San Diego uh, last week and I was able to kick the tires and, and uh, spin up some benchmarks on the new Snapdragon 845. That is a <clears throat> combination um, uh, ARM CPU and, uh, or off the shelf, I should say, uh, uh, custom tuned ARM CPU uh, architecture with. Um, Qualcomm uh, custom Adreno 630 graphics. And so it's it's actually um, an impressive chip all around. Um, uh, Qualcomm went in, back to the drawing board and from the grounds up redesigned uh, the chip with a new Cairo 385 CPU. There is a Spectra image processor in there, Spectra 280 ISP, as well as a 685, what they call the Hexagon 685 DSP, digital signal processor and Adreno 630 GPU. So all on board in this integrated SOC. Um, it's an entire mobile platform. You also get the Snapdragon X20 LTE modem. Um, it's it's really a, an entire platform, mobile platform as, as Qualcomm terms it. Um, but the Snapdragon 845, and yeah, actually uh, claims 30% faster graphics, 20% uh, better uh, CPU throughput. And in the benchmarks, in fact, uh, it put put up those numbers. We actually um, showed it compared to a bunch of uh, current generation Snapdragon 835 devices from uh, the Moto Z to Samsung Galaxy uh, Note 8 and Galaxy um, S8 series. Um, and yes, what we saw on average was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20% uh, better CPU throughput depending on the application. Uh, and some are on the order of 15 to actually 35, I even saw in, in some cases, better graphics performance in some of the graphics benchmarks. And we, we hit everything from Geekbench to 3D Mark to you name it, uh, GFX Bench, T-Rex, Manhattan, lots of different uh, benchmarks. There you're looking at Jetstream, which is um, a web-based benchmark, uh, includes browser performance. Interestingly, <clears throat> what we saw here versus... Um, I guess what the bulk of uh, Android phones are b based on uh, Qualcomm's uh, previous generation Snapdragon 835, that performance gain was there versus Apple's A11 Bionic. It was not so, um, it was not so much the same. We, it, was, it was more of a trade-off in performance. CPU side of the house, Apple's A11 Bionic still has an edge uh, in throughput for sure. Certainly single threaded, single core performance. Apple does a whole heck of a lot at tuning their CPU performance along with the OS, coupled with the OS. Um, so that, that tighter coupling, because it's dedicated for a single platform and it's Apple's and that's it, 
It's not like Android where you have all these different manufacturers that are building to um, you know, Qualcomm's platform. Um, so that tighter coupling of OS uh, with iOS versus Android and the CPU allows Apple to keep their edge. On the graphics side of the house, however, I actually was able to, to compare notes there and it, and it turns out that um, Qualcomm has raised the bar considerably versus Apple and in most cases is either on par or slightly better. We even saw a couple of instances where they were slightly better than Apple's um, A11 processor with its integrated graphics core. So really impressive stuff. Um, I think next generation um, uh, smartphones, Android smartphones based on this platform are going to be great products. It, you know, just from a from a sheer silicon uh, per, you know, perspective, um, I think there's some really nice promise there for next generation Android phones. You're going to get that extra performance. You're probably wondering about battery life. Um, most folks and we've we've. Uh, you know, uh, often profiled our readers here and, um, you know, what's what's important to most folks in terms of smartphones. Qualcomm also will tell you battery life is paramount. It's it's absolutely up there in the top three. Um, interestingly enough, we also ran some power numbers on it. We actually uh, had Qualcomm had a demo up where they were running GFX Bench Manhattan as well as uh, running um, 4K60 video and measuring um nominal power draw over that um over those two workloads and comparing it to snapdragon 835 and what we saw was um actual lower power consumption for snapdragon 845 um at the same workloads so in other words if you capped that benchmark uh gfx bench at 30 frames per second and you 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 know level the playing field from a uh throughput um, lower lower uh, power consumption uh, to the order of about uh, twenty percent in some cases. On the video side, it was the same thing. Here you got four K sixty uh, frames per second video, and it was consuming less power than the previous generation. So you've got this ability to to boost and 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 um, drive additional performance and throughput, but also the ability to scale back and consume less power when you don't need it. So hopefully, coupled with um, Android Oreo and, and all the benefits of, of uh, you know, Android Doze and, and all the, the power savings, power getting features of Android. This can be a, a pretty compelling platform. What do you guys think? Uh, Marco, I know you've spent some time looking at Snapdragon 845. What are your thoughts on it? Um, it looks strong. Um, going into the last couple of days, I, I thought it was going to be the, the monster SOC on the market uh, coming up this year. But looking at it versus A11, and I guess there was a rumor today about how the Samsung Exynos uh, performs, um, and that looks really strong. I don't know. I think it's obviously going to be a huge step up over 835. I think it's going to have optimizations for the, the Windows-based machines that haven't been talked about yet. It's going to be strong, uh, stronger in those type of devices. Uh, they're going to sweep most of the premium smartphones in the U.S. Yeah. no matter what. Um, but I think stiff competition out there. Yeah. But yeah, it looks good. Yeah, yeah. Paul, what do you think? You ever going to part ways, pull your, your claws off that iPhone of yours? Never, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It's, you know, it's another strong chip from Qualcomm. I get, I have a little bit of a hard time getting excited these days about new mobile chips and phones because I'm not, doing anything that requires, you know, increasingly faster performance. But I think what's interesting is what Marco touched on is, is what it will bring to uh, the Windows laptops that are based on Qualcomm chips. So, you know, there, there's motivation there to, to keep cranking out, you know, earlier, faster chips. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that's a, that is a good point. Um, Qualcomm did not go on record about their intentions to bring Snapdragon 845 to uh, Windows 10 uh, devices. Um, they, however, didn't deny it either. Uh, and so you can sort of read between the tea leaves. There, there aren't any announcements to make there. Most manufacturers don't talk about uh, unannounced product or product initiatives. Um, so that's not surprising. It would be very surprising, however, if Snapdragon 845 didn't come to Windows 10 devices as well. Um, I think that's in the works. But um, but not commented on officially by by Qualcomm yet just yet. So 
yeah um better performance for for two and ones uh, ultralight two and ones in that space and that that initiative they have going with um the oems that are that are a part of that hp asus um lenovo they've all announced products based on snapdragon 835 so you would think 845 would be coming to those types of products as well and yeah that, that should be exciting um you, you made you made a point marco about um about the Exynos uh, processor that, that Samsung puts together for um, other phones that are not US devices, uh, other Galaxy devices. Um, it, that was actually a, a benchmark leak in Geekbench. Geekbench, by the way, is one data point. I think we need to you know, take that with a grain of salt. It's, it's a synthetic benchmark. It's, it's a pretty reliable one. It's one that scales. Um, pretty well based on multi-core and single core throughput, but it's it is just one data point and and that's what we always caution folks with respect to benchmark leaks is yeah you'll get a leak it's nice it's interesting it's fun to talk about you know always something to digest but um, until you see the full performance profile of a processor a product what have you you really don't know the complete picture and it's hard to judge based on that but but yeah I, I think you're right Marco I think stiff competition. And it's great to have Qualcomm rising, raising the bar. It's great to have uh, Apple, you know, running hot to, to to do the best they can with iPhones. You know, Google cranking, you know, as much as they can with the Android platform. Um, it's a good time to be in tech with all this competition, right, fellas? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, let's move on to um, something. Um, let's see. What, what, what you guys want to talk about? You want to talk about Ryzen Threadripper mining? You want to talk about that or you want to talk about SSDs and, and other crazy stuff? Let's what get the mining out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. I was getting all like parched, so I have to take a sip of my water. Mm. I can start. Mining. <laughs> nah, yeah. So dive right in, man. I uh, I actually did the article, but um, yeah, tell me how I did. Did I, did I screw it up? <laughs> no, so, you know this is one of those things that may um, may annoy lots of people, but you know there's um, there's a whole contingent of miners and a whole uh, group of CPU optimized miners that seem to perform really well on AMD's Threadripper because there's a ton of cash on board. So we did some testing mining Monero, and the a Threadripper 1950X is is faster than you know, a, a more expensive Intel CPU is faster than the 7900X. It's also faster than a GeForce 1080 Ti mining Monero. Now you're not gonna get rich. It would take, you know, depending on the value that day and how much you're paying for power, you know, a, a few months to maybe a little over a year to pay for the hardware, just to pay for the hardware. But you get decent Monero mining performance and maybe you get lucky and, you know, value of uh, Monero takes off and you make a few bucks, but, um, yeah, you get decent mining performance without insane amounts of power. And because the way Monero works, the way the mining works on Threadripper, uh, you get basically a maximum of 16 threads. I think it was something like two megabytes per thread, or I might, I'm probably getting those numbers wrong, but you, you end up utilizing about 60% of the CPU. So even if you're mining and, and getting, you know, maximum mining performance, the system's still responsive. You can still use it. You can still do other stuff. So it's kind of an interesting proposition. If you're, uh, you know, teetering uh, with the idea of getting a Threadripper and maybe you're not going to use it a whole, you know, a ton, yeah, you might as well mine in the background and pay for it over the course of, of a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a good summary. Thank you. Yeah, no, actually, um, there's there's an algorithm, Kryptonite algorithm, uh, N-I-G-H-T, uh, uh, Kryptonite. Um, that's the algorithm uh, for a group of currencies based on the crypto note. And and among them are uh, Monero, Dash, Dashcoin is another one. There's a few. There's a half dozen or so, maybe more. And uh, that is a CPU. Kryptonite is a CPU optimized algorithm. And um, we were tipped off that you know Threadripper does pretty well here. And and as you noted, Marco, it's because of uh, Threadripper's large 32 megabyte cache. Intel's 7900X uh, Skylake X chip has something like 13.75 megs of cache. Um, not enough to hold the uh, an, an entire workload in cash, but with Threadripper, you can you can keep that workload in cash and then just hash on it until it's done, and you can move on to the next workload. So it's, <coughs> it's 
set up and efficient that way um, for, for mining. And yeah, we, you know, we, we wanted to get it out there and, and say, hey, look at this. If you, if you are already on the Threadripper pr platform, you've got this opportunity in front of you. You don't just have to mine on GPUs. And um, I don't think you're going to see a, a heavy duty run on Threadripper for this, you know, exclusively. But it's a nice little kicker for folks that are considering it that maybe you don't want to. I mean, if you've ever mined on a GPU, if, if you have it in your own rig uh, and it's your personal workstation or gaming rig or what have you, I'm sure you've seen, you know, and, and heard uh, and, and even felt the temperature of those things. It's it's cranking the GPU. There's, you're not really going to do much else if you're mining on a GPU with that GPU with this. With Threadripper, you absolutely could, as you pointed out, Marco. The system responsiveness is is still there. You're only using about 60% CPU util utilization to get sort of an optimized hash rate. Um, if you added more threads, you were right, Marco. 16 threads is kind of the sweet spot. If you added more threads, you don't get more hash performance. So you can you can sit there at about 60% CPU utilization and have your your system still cranking away, not pumping a lot out a, lot, a ton more heat. You know, you get usually you have a, a water cooler on that thing and it's quiet as a mouse anyway. So you don't have a lot of heat, extra heat and noise. It did take the the core CPU temp up a little bit. Uh, it's like 50 to 60. I think when we overclocked, it hit like 60 uh, TDI temp, 60 C. Um, but uh, at stock speeds, it was like 52, you know, mining, which is, you know, no, no problem at all. So interesting little... Um, you know, opportunity for, for folks looking at Threadripper that uh, perhaps didn't in the past. And another sort of advantage point for for uh, AMD over Intel in, in that architecture, that particular architecture. Ryzen Threadripper 1920, by the way, also has um, 32 megs of cache on board and is um, less expensive, obviously, than the 1950 um, 16 core chip. You get down to 12 core chip and save a little bit more money and probably get close to the same kind of hash rate because you've got that fat cash on board too. So um, interesting stuff. Paul, have you uh, played with mining at all yet? Are you into the scene, man? <laughs> no, I haven't. But for those who do, please go this route and leave our graphics cards alone. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> uh you know on a related to... note though how did how did you like that motherboard i like um i've seen a few of the different uh gigabyte designers or designer i don't know how they want to pronounce it uh on a few different platforms and they look sexy i think yeah it's a it's a it's a really nice motherboard actually there it is a good screenshot of it thanks uh john yeah no it's a fabulous looking motherboard um really well built you can see it's got um the metal lined uh peg slots pci express slots and you know let's get some lighting bling and yeah it was super stable for us and you know I, I beat on that thing nine ways from sunday from mining on the cpu and gpu simultaneously that's another option as well obviously if you have threadripper going and you got a gpu in there you can mine on both and make a little bit more on top of your gpu mining um yeah great great little board uh gigabyte does a nice job with that and um it's a great platform stable platform for uh, Rise and Threadripper. I, I highly recommend it. Um, I enjoyed my time with it. Um, you know, it's funny that the folks at AMD and you, you mentioned the the market pressure on GPUs with with mining. And, you know, we we spoke to the folks at AMD about that, and you know that that's what they're saying is maybe this is you know a way to alleviate some of that pressure. Maybe folks will start looking at more CPU optimized mining algorithms. I, I don't know enough about. The algorithms and, and the different, you know, e Ethereum's got Dagger Hashimoto. These are all GPU targeted algorithms. You know, can we see why is it that the GPU has been targeted? I mean, it's obviously a very scalable architecture and it's tasked. It does, you know, one thing repetitively really well. That's what GPUs do. Marco, do you have any theories there? It's the, the massive amounts of bandwidth between the local frame buffer memory and and the GPUs that also, you know, that, that's important. You are correct, sir. Yes. You look at system memory, you know, a fast desktop system with dual channel, major, you know, you're looking at what, you know, 35 to 40 gigs a second, whereas you're talking yeah. hundreds of gigabytes a second on a, on a GPU. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, the fatter the cash, you know, on the CPU, the more opportunity for mining you get there. And that's why Threadripper does well. Well, anyways, let's move on. We uh, we got a couple more bullets to to check off here before we uh, close the show and we get some interesting stuff. Marco, you looked at a couple of new SSDs, one from Samsung and the other from 
Intel. Uh, the Samsung is a SATA model, but in an M2 gumstick style. And uh, the Intel is an NVMe SSD, right? So, yeah, let me let got. me just let, let me do the the Intel SSD first quickly because this is more for the enterprise crowd. Let me just show it off for a second because it it is really sexy. So it's that's tiny. The, it's it's pretty cool. I mean the the M dot two is really tiny. So yeah. this is the the Intel SSD DCP forty six hundred uh, NVMe SSD. So this guy, this is not an Optane drive. This has a this has NAND flash memory. It does not have three D cross point memory on board. Um, but this guy's um, this guy's a speedy little beast. You're talking uh, sequ sequential reads uh, greater than three gigabytes per second, and uh, you know writes tested at you know a gig and a half per second with really good latency. Actually, latency in a couple of tests was nearly as good as Optane, um, competitive with the, with the Optane drive. Though the Optane drive I had was a consumer drive. I don't have one of the enterprise class Optanes on hand. Um, and, you know, massive uh, massive IOPS numbers too. With 4K random reads and writes, the drive's actually rated for up to 700,000 um, random 4K IOPS. So just a beast of, a, of an SSD. If you have sort of a, um, you know, enterprise application or even small to medium business where you need massive amounts of fast storage drive like this it's you know it used to be these enterprise drives were many many thousands of dollars the two terabyte model is uh only 1700 now that's still a lot of money but versus previous gen uh, enterprise ssds it's really not you know you're talking less than a dollar a gigabyte for true enterprise yeah. class storage so really really a cool drive now the other one that you mentioned, I'm going to hold this little baby up. Th this is kind of, I don't know where I stand on this drive, to be honest. <laughs> the review went up this morning. This is the um, Samsung SSD 860 Evo in M.2 flavor. So these drives will be available in standard 2.5 inch SATA drives in M SATA varieties mm -hmm. and these M.2 drives. Now, to put it simply, in terms of a SATA-based SSD, this is one of the best drives you can get, in my opinion, right? You're, you're talking transfers that bump into the limits of SATA with some of the best latency that we saw on a uh, SATA SSD and also some of the best 4K transfers we've seen on a SATA SSD. And these are decent endurance, about half the endurance of the 860 Pro, but way more than the previous gen 850s. And... Um, price competitive as well. I think it was something like 27 to 34 cents a gigabyte, depending on the capacity. So a strong SATA based SSD, it makes sense if you only have a two and a half inch, you know, a system that can take a SATA connector, or maybe you have an older system with, with M SATA. The M.2 flavor, as nice a drive as it is, for yeah. you know 25 percent more, you might as well go NVMe if you've got a system with an M.2 slot. In my opinion, I would sacrifice a little capacity if you were on, you know, had a budget to get the performance of NVMe over the particular M.2 flavor of this drive. But, you know, maybe you have tons of budget. You have a motherboard with two M.2 slots and you want bulk fast storage without sticking a hard drive in. Then this is a damn good drive to keep a system nice and clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I didn't even think about that. Um, you know, my thought was, this is a SATA drive for folks that don't have uh, NVMe support in their system. And w when you think of that, traditionally, you think of the SATA form factor, the two and a half inch form factor. But if you have an M2 slot in your system, chances are these days you're going to have NVMe support, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. all the modern systems, yeah. I'm sure there's some other boards that maybe didn't get BIOS updates that won't boot right. I, I'm not sure of any off the top of my head, but... Yeah, if you have an M.2 slot, save up a few more pennies and grab an NVMe drive. <laughs> this <laughs> so this advice. is really a low cost bulk bulk storage option or low, lower cost option that's still plenty nimble, 500 megabytes per, per second with you know all the nice latency characteristics. By the way, low latency characteristics of NVMe versus standard SATA, or excuse me, yep. um, yeah, M2 and, and PCI Express versus standard SATA. Um, but um, you know, where, where I could see this being interesting is um, you have someone with a decent budget building a gaming rig. 
they want a really fast, smaller NVMe drive or Optane for their OS, but they mm. don't want a hard drive for, say, their Steam folder, their games. Then this is a really price competitive, fast SATA SSD. And if you want to build a really clean system, just pop this in your other M.2 slot, no cables to deal with. You yeah. know, literally like no no power cables, no data cables, just pops right in the M.2 slot. And then you have a really great drive for a big Steam folder. Um, it's nowhere near as cheap as a hard drive, but in terms of fast SATA SSDs, probably the best choice out there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's still like 20, 30 cents a gig, right? It's not bad. It's it's pretty, yeah. pretty cheap. I mean, and it, it literally it's one of... You can make an argument it's the fastest SATA SSD out there. The only thing faster is the more expensive 860 Pro, really. So it's it's a it's a really good SATA SSD. It's just the, the this particular M.2 one you have to make a real specific use case for it. Yeah, well, you, I think we'll also see this in, in as an as an OEM uh, config in things like two and ones and and notebooks, right? Thin and lights. Yeah, that that have M2 SATA, right? But this is this Correct. is actually the retail consumer SKU that you looked at. Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool stuff. It's always good to have more SSDs. We love SSDs in general, it's right? Fun. fun. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> fun stuff to test, man. The SSDs are awesome. If you if you haven't experienced a, a modern system with an SSD, you're really missing out. It's if you're on Windows 7 and even if you had the fastest hard drive available a few years ago and you think your system feels OK for now, man, upgrade to an SSD. Just do it and thank us later. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thank us later. Do it now. Thank us later. Um, good stuff. Yeah. Swing on by and, and check out Marco's reviews on those SSDs. We've got lots of data points up there. You can see all the testing we do. And uh, a couple of couple of new interesting options in the market now. Uh, one from Intel for the data center, and the 860 Evo from Samsung for consumers. Um, shipping now. Um, hey, uh, John, pull this one up when you get a chance. The last thing we'll talk about today is Boston Dynamics Spot Mini can now help its friends escape captivity. Captivity. This is this was a freaky thing, John. If you can pull up the video and, and run it. Um, <clears throat> Boston Dynamics, if you haven't heard of them, um, is a, uh, a robotics company based in Boston, Massachusetts. Go figure. And uh, here you can see the dog, one of their robot dogs walking in now, assessing the situation. This is just wild. And he's looking around. He's like, hey, buddy, I need a little help here. Uh, this door is keeping me from getting in the other room. And his buddy comes over. He's like, oh, yeah, I got that for you. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and his buddy with the telescopic arm and hand now opens the door and says, I got this. Let me get the door for you. I'm your doorman and lets his buddy through. And the bots are now cooperating to escape that room. There you go. <laughs> and the door shuts. It's just like, I swear these, I swear these guys at Boston Dynamics, they like, they set up these demos to just freak people out. <laughs> You know, they want to work. Yeah, man. <laughs> totally freaky as they can make it. And it was just just wild stuff. But how about that, man? Robotics these days. I mean, just amazing stuff. I mean, you have a quad ped there, which is cool in and of itself. That thing looks like a, you know, a great, you know, a great Dane or maybe a Doberman Pinscher or whatever. Badass dog, right? Robotic dog. But <laughs> you know, it's got the vision, it's got the now it's got, you know, tactility with the arm. Wild stuff. What do you guys think about that? Are we all going to get like, a, 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 is this Skynet like building now? And we're all going to be owned by these things. <laughs> <laughs> I well. mean, if the Tide Pod challenge is any indicator, humans are getting dumber. <laughs> right? We are as a race. We are stupid and dumb and do stupid stuff. Um, so eventually we're probably going to get wiped out. I don't know if these little skinny guys with the little pitter patter of their quad feet are going to do it, but yeah, we're, we're, we're doomed. We're so screwed. Yeah. We're, we're getting dumber and the robots are getting smarter. So it's, it's a terrifying combination. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's funny. I think, I think one of the other Boston dynamics demos we saw a couple of months back was guy was testing the robot and it was a, 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 a two legged robot, a biped. And he was behind the thing with a hockey stick and he'd knock it over and the thing would get up and it would, you know, on its own. And I'm just, and everybody was just thinking to themselves, don't piss it off, man. Don't piss it off. They're going to come back and kill us. 
<laughs> but yeah, I mean, just wild stuff. I mean, it, you know, Google bought them and then spit them back out. And I wonder why that was. I mean, there was some interesting commentary. I think, you know, people were sort of fearing the combination of Google AI with, with, with this robotic capability, maybe. I don't know. But well, I mean, you know, if you're going to have robots with the entirety of human knowledge, they're going to be connected and have access to the web with, you know, with AI, machine learning, yeah. and smart algorithms to search the web. So we really are not that far off from a humanoid type robot with literally with the entirety of human knowledge access to it in the blink of an eye. There's yeah. no way we're not screwed. We're 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 done. We're done. <laughs> Oh, come on now. That's all right. That's a little bit tinfoil hat. You can't you can't go that far. But I mean, well, we'll, yeah. we'll have the three rules. We'll have the whole I robot BS and the three rules do no harm. But, you know, things malfunction. And I don't know, man, I am not a, <laughs> I am not confident in, in the future of humans. Like we are we're meat sacks versus these machines. You know, it's nothing. So we'll see. This is where Marco peels back the skin on his face and reveals that he's really a cyborg. So he and he knows yeah. what he's talking about. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> he is for. a terminator. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, I'm one of the lizards from V though, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's 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 amazing stuff. You know, I, I'm probably I'm not too far down the street from those guys at Boston Dynamics. I would love to stop by their facility and do a little interview, roll the cameras, and uh, see what these guys are doing over there because it is just amazing. And you know, you, you look at some of their demos, and they they're like scaling walls and you know jumping up and doing all these things that humans can't do. You know, frankly, um, you know, physical things and just you know, wild, wild stuff. And yeah, it's, it's exciting and a little bit freaky to think about what, what we're doing with robotics and AI and when that all comes together and how it's all going to coexist with us and hopefully just help and serve us. That's the idea. <laughs> well, you know, since you're right up the road, instead of going down there and interviewing somebody, why don't you do humanity a favor and just go tear the whole building down and just wreck the whole place? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. I'm a geek. I want to see that go too, you know, but yeah, they'd probably arrest me. That wouldn't be good. Or, or I'd get killed doing it by the, by the robots probably. <laughs> They'll have sentries out there. You kidding me? They'll have turrets like taking me out. Yeah, don't uh, be surprised. If, if yeah. what they're showing us is this little dog, you open the door, it means yeah. they have a silver back that could like wreck a friggin' tank. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Little doggy. Yeah, Spot, they call him. That's a cute little name, Spot. <laughs> uh, it's just just wild stuff. And it's it's great to see uh, the tech and evolving. And uh, yeah, no, just funny, freaky stuff from Boston Dynamics. You gotta love it. Well, I think that wraps us up. Um, we are um, out of time, Marco. Um, we have uh, we're working on a giveaway next. Are you going to build something for us, maybe for for the winners? I I, I absolutely want to. Um, have not lined up all the hardware yet. I would love to build a system. I am going to build myself a system on camera as soon as I have some freaking downtime. It's been so busy. Um, but yes, we will give away something soon. Although considering we're probably going to get wiped out as soon as these robots get free, is probably little point in doing another giveaway. But. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll do something soon. We'll leave it at that. So negative. So negative. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> uh, maybe we should build a Threadripper system with folks like that. Yeah, man. That would be cool. Yeah, if we can get yeah, AMD to help us cool. out. Yeah. That would rock. If AMD's watching, send some, uh, accidentally send us enough for a system build. There you go. There you go. So uh, we'll, we'll have to reach out, but we're always giving away something at hothardware.com almost every month. So we're, we're teeing up the next uh, giveaway. Marco's itching to build a new system, so it's probably going to be something really nice. And uh, stay tuned uh, to to Hot Hardware, where you can find us on the web, Facebook Facebook.com. Easy for me to say, Hot Hardware. Twitter.com slash Hot Hardware. YouTube.com slash Hot Hardware or Hot Hardware Vids, where we'd like you to thumb up and subscribe if you would, because we're here every Wednesday and you'll get notices and we won't spam you. We promise. But thumb up and subscribe because we'd like to have you with us more often. Paul, any parting words for the viewers and uh, listeners? Yes. Do not forget the roses and candy. Yeah. Yeah. Take care of your loved one, dang it. Or you'll be sorry. Or maybe not. Maybe you don't care because, you know, you're single and whatever. Have fun. But thanks for stopping by, everybody. We'll catch you in the next one.